sleep seems to optimize some of those hormones um, and also as it relates to appetite hormones as well. So when you're sleep deprived, you crave more fats, you crave more sugar. Hey guys, it's Corey from Redefining Strength. Welcome to the Fitness Hacks Podcast. So in today's episode, I want to cover how our metabolism actually works and tips to improve our metabolic health. I know due to previous dieting practices and even age, we can sometimes feel like our metabolism has slowed down and that we're just doomed to gain weight, but that really isn't the case. So I want to go over not only how the metabolism actually works, but tips to help you improve your metabolic health, especially as you get older and what age actually means in terms of our metabolic rate. I then want to go over the mindsets behind getting results and some of the mindsets that might be sabotaging our metabolic health. I then have a great interview I did with Dr. Amy Bender, who is a sleep expert, and she's going to share tips to improve the quality of your sleep because how well we're sleeping and recovering can be really key to our metabolic health and even seeing the results that we deserve. I'm then going to share six metabolism boosting foods and a delicious recipe, which I actually chowed down on just the other day, uh, and some great reasons why these foods are so key to improving your metabolic rate. And then we're going to end with a great workout that will really help you increase the metabolism, see great muscle building results and feel fabulous. So let's jump right in. So let's talk about metabolism and how it actually works. So what is your metabolism? Our metabolism really is the sum of all of the metabolic processes our body does. The easiest way to understand your metabolism is to refer to it as your total daily energy expenditure. It's all the energy your body expends to function or to basically just survive on a daily basis. So it's your TDEE. So what is our total daily energy expenditure? Let's quickly break down this so you know how you're sort of expending your calories throughout the day. So number one, resting metabolic rate. This is the calories you basically need just to survive. And it represents about 60 to 70 percent of your daily energy expenditure. Next on that list is the physical activity. Uh, Those are those workouts that you do. This is that conscious burning of calories that we do when we're being physically active. The third thing is NEAT, and this is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So it's all the calories we burn from fidgeting, moving throughout the day, getting up to do our extra mobility work, which I know everybody's doing, or if you're like me, you know, talking with your hands and moving all over the place. The fourth and final thing is the thermic effect of food. So this is the energy your body uses to break down the foods you eat and turn them into energy. These are really the four components that make up your metabolic rate. And I know we often think just like metabolism, it's one thing, but it really is these different components. Okay. And all of our energy expenditure can vary daily and over the course of our life due to our previous dieting and workout practices. And even if you think about all these different things, how much you're fidgeting that day, how active you're able to be, the types of food that that you're eating. It's why a calorie deficit and creating that calorie deficit and seeing results isn't just as simple as calories in versus calories out. So we've all thought, you know, my metabolism is broken. And it's because our metabolism is very adaptable. And your metabolism adapts because from a survival standpoint, this is actually good and it works to our advantage. So we can, oddly enough, see this as an opportunity over seeing it as an obstacle. Because if something adapts, it means at any point we can adapt it in a direction we like. So this is why you might not lose fat. And it's not about just calories in versus calories out. But again, it also means that you have control then to make a change. So let's talk a little bit about what actually causes our metabolism to adapt. So why does your metabolism adapt? Well, your body wants to function efficiently and it wants to survive. Yay, we like living. So make sure that it's covering the energy needs of your resting metabolic rate first and focus all of your energy there as needed. So that's why our body fights the weight loss process. When less energy is coming in, our body will find a way to use less energy. Again, trying to survive. Usually we see our need go down. Uh, you might see the performance in, your, in the gym go down. You'll even see that bodily functions might change because of the energy coming in. We, we see these adaptations because our body is trying to be more efficient and run off of fewer calories. Not to mention less body mass. So as you even lose weight over the course of your weight loss journey means that you actually need less energy to survive as a human. That's why, you know, you might be jealous of your, your husband or your friend who's bigger, who and taller than you, who can burn more calories and eat more. But often 
as we're trying to diet down to the more extreme the deficit that we create, the more we start to use muscle mass as fuel. So in the weight loss process, yes, just losing even fat, we need less energy to survive because we don't necessarily have that weight on us. But especially if we start to create that extreme calorie deficit, we are going to end up losing more muscle. We do this because muscle requires more energy to be maintained. So if our body is like, I don't have enough energy, I don't want to expend it keeping something on that's only costing me more. So instead of using store fat, which is good to keep on and doesn't strain our body to protect it and even save it for future use, we're going to use that lean muscle mass, which is causing us to need to burn more calories right now. Not to mention on top of the fact that we might use muscle mass because we want to expend fewer calories, when we're actually eating less, we have less of an impact on our metabolic rate from the thermic effect of food. We're not using as much energy simply to process that food and the fuel. So in terms of all this, what can we do to avoid these adaptations and even reverse them? And then how does age really factor in? So you might be thinking, you know, hey, I'm getting older. I'm just doomed to see metabolic slowdown. I've heard my metabolism slows down, you know, every decade. But how much is this actually a factor and how much are other lifestyles factors really at play? So age does lead to metabolic changes. As we get older, we don't generally need as much energy to survive, partly because we aren't as active and we lose muscle. But these are things that are within our control. Yes, getting older does mean it's harder to build and retain lean muscle. And yes, you know, again, we don't necessarily have to expend as much energy for some of those bodily functions, especially as we get over 60, we see more changes. But so much of what we attribute to age is actually lifestyle factors and previous dieting factors adding up. Studies have really shown that there isn't as much of a decline in our metabolic rate until after 60, and even then it's very small per year. So basically, is it really your age? Nope. Okay, so honestly, becoming an adult is where we really see the biggest change, and then not really again till after 60 is there any sort of slowdown that really can have any sort of blame, and even then, again, it's lifestyle factors adding up. If you think about the lifestyle factors that we're seeing, One in four U.S. adults is not active enough and not hitting that minimum needed activity. That's that's definitely inactive. That's definitely going to create metabolic changes and metabolic adaptations. Also, if you think about dieting practices, creating an extreme diet or deficit in the past is partly to blame. You probably lost muscle in the process and you've made your body more efficient off of running off of fewer calories. So if you've dieted down and eaten 800 calories, your body's like, well, great, we can survive off of 800 calories. So anytime you eat over that, that then is now a surplus, so to speak, because your body's efficient at using less. Not to mention if you focus a lot on cardio or not done strength work, you might not have as much muscle mass on. And that muscle, again, uses more energy to be maintained and therefore is going to boost your metabolic rate because you'll need more energy to keep on that lean muscle. And on top of uh, the fact that we might not have done the strength work we need or we might have had previous dieting practices that did hinder our retaining and building lean muscle, getting older does make building lean muscle even more challenging. We aren't able to utilize protein as efficiently, and so we need to be conscious of that as we are changing our dieting practices to help improve our metabolic rate and keep on muscle as we get older. Plus, as we get older, we might see aches and pains add up. Again, I will attribute a lot of this to our Not so great sometimes mobility practices early on, injuries we let sort of flare up and ignored, uh, but that can lead to us moving less, not training the way that we really need to see the results that we want. So while we wanna blame age and there are changes that happen with age, we have to recognize how much of our metabolic adaptations are really due to lifestyle factors, factors that we can now impact. So let's talk about how can you actually keep your metabolism healthy? So while I'm going to go over more details in like the next few segments of this podcast, including having some great tips from Dr. Amy Bender on how to improve the quality of your sleep, which will help keep hormones balanced and actually help you see better fat loss results and keep that metabolism humming, uh, I want to talk about some other ways really to keep your body functioning optimally. And I want to give you an overview right now of where your focus should be. And I will tell you 100%, it is not on fat burners or trying to exercise more, okay? So keeping your metabolism healthy. Of course, there are, you know, health concerns that may impact how you go about adjusting your lifestyle factors to see results. 
but you need to realize that you can only focus on controlling what you can control. All those other things don't matter, but we can do so much, okay? Stop the extreme dieting practices. Even if you wanna lose weight, you might have to go through a period of reverse dieting, increasing your calories first, but think about that small deficit. I know it's tempting to do, you know, go more extreme to see faster weight loss results, but those ultimately will sabotage you. So small calorie deficit, focusing on macros, especially in protein. Higher protein diets are the only ones that have been shown to actually help you retain and build lean muscle mass while in that deficit. So if you want to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, and especially as we get older, we need to focus on that protein, okay? Then make sure you're staying active. And this doesn't mean just working out more. We have to think about that need. Think about, you know, especially if you are, you know, dieting down and maybe you do feel like, okay, my energy levels are changing as I'm adapting to these new macros. Be conscious to get up and do that mobility work. Be conscious to go on those walks. Be conscious to move more. And then don't ignore the importance of that recovery, of improving the quality of your sleep. You know, there's so much that we can do to impact the length of time that we can sleep, but we can always work to improve that quality. And I can't wait for you to check out Dr. Amy Bender's tips. But even focus on the quality of your recovery between your sessions, of the rest between the the rounds of your workout even. Focus on all these other factors. We have to recognize that everything is sort of a stressor, right? And it's good and bad stressors. And while working out is a good stressor, it can also become a negative if we're doing too much. So we want to find that balance, giving ourselves ample recovery, not only physically, but also mentally. And then really focus on building muscle. Stop seeing your workouts as just that chance to burn more calories and focus on building that lean muscle, which will make you a lean, mean, metabolism humming machine, okay? So I'm excited next to uh, dive into more on the mindset and the dieting mindset that can hold us back from having the healthy metabolism that we actually want. I wanna talk about the crash dieting mindset. And I know dieting in general, or the word diet has become really demonized recently. And we have to recognize that diet just simply means the foods that we actually eat habitually, okay? It doesn't have to mean restriction. And I've seen it, you know, recently even posting things on tracking and macros, how people be like, oh, this is promoting that dieting mindset and unhealthy lifestyle. And it's, it's not, like what we measure, we can manage. And we can end up restricting and doing more whether we track or not. And so whether or not tracking is right for you is a whole other discussion. But I think the key mindset we have to get out of isn't tracking or macros, but or even intuitive eating or whatever else. It's the do more mindset. Okay. So much of what we default back to is trying to out control time. We think if we do more, add in more things, even overcomplicate, which should be simple, we're going to see better results faster. And it's because it comes back to control. We want to exert more control, feel more in control of the results we're getting. But in this trying to control things more, we end up sabotaging our long-term consistency, our long-term success. It's why I slightly struggle when people comment, oh, that's so much hard work and discipline. I'm like, well, yes, discipline is a factor. Hard work is definitely a factor, but it's ultimately embracing that things take time and that consistency, being willing to meet yourself where you're you're at and even do the minimum of time. So if you want to create the healthiest metabolic rate, the most sustainable lifestyle, it's less about doing more, less about hard work, and more about meeting yourself where you're at. And the more you try and overcomplicate things or look for that fast fix, the more you're going to sabotage yourself. Because while there are ways to design with purpose to create uh, training smarter, eating smarter, you know, more purposeful plans in place, so we're not just working hard without direction, we have to recognize that trying to find those fast fixes will hold us back. Like fat burners, they might provide some, you know, pretty instant results, but they're very dangerous. I don't recommend them. Uh, pre-workouts, I don't recommend. They're dangerous. They haven't been studied. You don't fully know what's in them a lot of times. But also, what might provide that fast fix usually backfires long term. Those things make you more dependent on them. So like even caffeine, you see a point in diminishing returns where initially that caffeine might help you and keep you energized. But unless you keep increasing your dosage, you're not going to see the same returns. And at some point, that's going to start to impact your hormone levels because of impacting your sleep. And it's going to lead to a point of diminishing returns where then even your metabolic rate declines if you don't keep up that same intake that you've been keeping up. So we have to realize that a lot of times these fast fixes that give us those instant results ultimately are what sabotage our long-term success. And so I bring this up because I think part of the do more attitude is also training longer adding in two-a-day sessions, creating that more extreme deficit, trying to restrict more foods, trying to eat cleaner versus always meeting ourselves where we're at. We have to recognize that those 1% improvements really add up. And then I think it's also recognizing that 
do more. We can, we can channel that, that energy, that desire to control towards really recognizing all the different stressors, all the different aspects of our life. And instead of just doing it towards doing more working out or doing more, you know, eating clean, restricting, think about how can I actually address doing more for my recovery? How can I address, you know, doing more to improve the quality of my sleep? How can I do more to actually recognize that by doing more training, I'm ultimately ending up overtraining, creating the stress in my body, which will sabotage me other places. So the do more can be used in a positive way of investigating other areas that you can create this holistic plan that addresses all the lifestyle factors. Because I think too, we get so caught up in doing more with our workout and diet because we feel out of control with those other areas, or we don't recognize that it really is about the balance of stressors across our lifestyle. If you're stressing more at work and you feel mentally tasked, potentially backing off your training might actually help create more of a balance versus trying to force yourself to do the same training routine you would when you aren't stressed or aren't as busy. You know, that, that, that balance just might be out of whack, right? That might work for you at one point, but not for another. And being able to adapt will really be key to help you see results, sleep better, you know, still be even driven to eat the way that you feel that you need to see the results that you want. So it's, recognizing that doing more can be being okay with doing less and even embracing that the doing more can be learning about all these different aspects. Okay. So we need to get out of the dieting mindset in that we need to get out of trying to out exercise, out diet, out do time. The more we can embrace those 1% improvements and that things are going to need to snowball as stinky as it is to be patient, the better off we're going to be. I'm super excited to talk about sleep with Dr. Amy Bender. Dr. Bender is an expert in sleep and performance who has studied and worked with the NBA, NHL, NFL, and Olympic athletes throughout Canada and the US. She's an adjunct assistant professor of kinesiology at the University of Calgary and a director of clinical sleep sciences at Cerebra. So let's jump right into the interview and great tips. I'm super excited to sit down with Dr. Amy Bender and talk about sleep because it is essential whether we want to, you know, improve our performance in the gym, PR in that next race, or even see better aesthetic changes. So welcome, Dr. Amy Bender. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I wanted to start by talking about the impact that sleep can actually have on the body recomp results that we want to see. You know, if we are working towards those aesthetic goals, we often focus on our nutrition and our workouts. But those aren't the only two things that matter. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if we look at some of the sleep deprivation research, we see an impact on testosterone, for example. So there was one study showing even um, a week of five hours in bed resulted in up to 15% less testosterone. Uh, Growth hormone is released during sleep. So we know that um, can be optimized with better sleep. And then there was a randomized control trial actually that comes to mind where they looked at 10 weeks of resistance exercise, uh, twice a week resistance exercise for 10 weeks. And they had a group where they um, gave them sleep education. So they kind of gave them tips on sleep hygiene. They gave them tips on um, how to improve the duration, how to improve the quality, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, just more sleep education. And they found actually that the group with the sleep education lost a bit more or gained a bit more lean mass, body mass. Um, The group with resistance exercise alone also gained lean body mass. But the key was the reduction in fat mass. So they found that with that sleep hygiene, in addition to resistance exercise, the group lost like 1.8 kilograms versus the group with just resistance exercise alone, which actually actually gained 0.8 kilograms of fat mass. So um, really fascinating work. I know that, you know, needs to be replicated, but just some interesting work where sleep seems to optimize some of those hormones. um, And also as it relates to appetite hormones as well. So when you're sleep deprived, you crave more fats, you crave more sugar, uh, and it's actually reflected in those hormones. So uh, less leptin being produced, that feeling of being full, uh, more ghrelin, which of course relates to body composition and you know what you'll be consuming. So very, very interesting work. 
And it's something that I think we don't focus on enough because there feels like there's less control over it, right? Like we think, oh, I can change what I'm doing in the gym. I can change what I'm putting in my mouth. But for a lot of people, it's like, well, I can't go to bed any earlier. I can't sleep any later. But it's not just about the length of sleep that we're getting. It's actually about the quality. And you mentioned hygiene to improve that quality. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, it's not just about the duration. Um, it's about improving the quality. Uh, I would argue that there's always a little more room to get more sleep. Um, and even even daytime sleep as well. So adding in a nap, for example, is you could potentially add in a 10 minute nap during your lunch, you know, those kind of things. Any place we can get that little bit of extra sleep. But of course, um, I could tell someone to be in bed for 10 hours, but if they're not getting good quality sleep, they're not going to feel refreshed. They're not going to have a lot of those benefits. So quality is definitely important. Um, So there's a lot of uh, different kind of sleep hygiene techniques that we all know about. Um, But maybe some of the ones that we don't know as much about would be something like getting uh, lots of light in the morning, which is going to help regulate our circadian rhythms, help us have better quality of sleep at night, Um, having a good pre-sleep routine. So preparing our mind and our body for sleep uh, is really valuable. Um, You know, thinking about those substances. So alcohol, not drinking too close to bedtime, caffeine, not too close to bedtime. Uh, those are all part of kind of the standard sleep hygiene things that we hear about. I think those are great tips because I don't think there's things we often consider. You know, we do sometimes go to the breathing. We think, okay, I need my wind down. But I think even the light in the morning is such a key component of it because it's it's all about that balance throughout the day. And that's even an opportunity to go for a walk, do something else that's a de-stressor, right? Get that light. But we also now have these wearables and we're all using more data but how do we actually use this data and is it relevant and how can it help impact our, our sleep hygiene and the quality of our sleep? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's measured can be managed. So I think these wearables or at least some way of tracking how you're sleeping, it could be with a paper questionnaire, but I think if we want to try and manage our sleep, we need to somehow measure it. Um, And so these wearables can be useful in that instance, but we really need to be aware of the data that's coming out from these. So what is, what should I be looking at? What is accurate? A lot of people will come to me and say, oh no, I only got 5% deep sleep. And I've even, even seen this in some of my wearable data as well, or kind of like 5% deep sleep. That doesn't make sense. And um, being um, a former uh, sleep technologist where I'm actually scoring EEG for different stages of sleep. There was never really a time and I've scored probably up to a thousand records where I saw someone with only 5% deep sleep, you know, so being aware of, of what information I should be gathering from these and the sleep stages are not very accurate at this point. So we may want to ignore that or not really take that as being the truth. Um, What is more valuable is related to the amount of sleep that you're getting. So these devices do a pretty good job at estimating the amount you're sleeping and tracking it across time as well. That's an important benefit of these devices is we can look at long-term use and long-term patterns. Um, And so it's not just looking at one night and, you know, trying to create all this valuable information on one night. It's like, what does this pattern look like across um, weeks, months, years is kind of something we need to be aware of. Um, The devices are getting better at staging. So for example, uh, Aura Ring, I think has a new algorithm out that uh, seems to be pretty good when it comes to estimating these stages. But my argument would be, how does that relate to my daytime performance? How does that relate to my subjective sleep? And there's a lack of clear connection between amount of deep sleep and how you're performing during the day. So that's another kind of important caveat, I think, for people to keep in mind. 
So it's almost using that data to compare it to how you're actually feeling, how you're performing your trends over time to then have that way to reflect and be like, okay, maybe I'm getting sick. Maybe I'm not feeling well. Maybe I'm seeing diminishing returns in my workouts because I'm doing too much and then sort of use the comparison almost. Yes, absolutely. It's linking those kind of lifestyle factors with what your data is showing um, for sure. Trying to um, look at more long-term patterns. Uh, am I very stressed at work? And is that the reason, like, can I incorporate maybe relaxation techniques or interventions that could help in that area? But yeah, definitely looking kind of at it more long-term and also the associations with those different lifestyle factors. And what about some of the lifestyle factors that are sort of out of our control? As women, when we start perimenopause and menopause, we can see interruptions in our sleep. Any tips to help us manage those times where our sleep is impacted, which impacts other things, but then we can't change the the fact that our hormone levels are changing. So... Yes, yes. It's a, it's a challenging time. And, and the data shows that we don't sleep as well as we're entering into those, you know, old, into those stages of life as a woman. Um, so some things we can do. So one study or multiple studies have been looking at cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And now that's the gold standard treatment for insomnia. And um, when we're going through these hormonal changes, you know, we may be more awake, more alert during the night, we may start to associate our bed with being awake. And so we may have more of those insomnia symptoms. And so can we kind of break that cycle with cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, which You can find a practitioner, potentially there's a lot of online programs, digital CBTI programs you can look into as well. So the research is showing that that's a useful intervention in those cases, but also having um, cooling techniques, having a glass of water, making sure your like bedding material and stuff, um, pajamas and those kind of things are um, uh, conducive to heat, you know, you don't want to be sweating in the middle of the night. So we more of those like natural fabrics, I guess you could say cotton, bamboo, those kind of things. Um, having a glass of water by the bedside, thinking about cooling a mattress, potentially like a mattress topper, those kind of things can be really useful, but then also having techniques to help you fall back to sleep. So a lot of times it'll be really common that you'll wake up during the middle of the night. You may have a hard time going back to sleep. So having some of those techniques in your back pocket, like breathing exercises, um, cognitive techniques, which I can go into if you if you want, maybe. I'd love to hear like one like top tip that yours is your go to if someone is like struggling to fall back asleep. Yes. No, I love, I love this technique. I actually did it last night. My uh, son, um, he's five. He's, I I have a older son who's 10 as eight year old girl. And then um, my youngest is five. So I'm getting over the hump with uh, (laughs) not having two young kids waking me up multiple times during the night. But um, even last night, my son ended up waking me up and I, I went straight to my middle of the night routine where I will do a breathing technique. So the important thing here is that you're exhaling longer than you're inhaling. So there's, for example, the four, seven, eight breathing where you can breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, breathe out for eight seconds, and you repeat that four times. You could do something like snake breathing where you breathe in and then hiss out like a snake. Uh, any t- anything that where you're breathing out longer than you're breathing in um, is a go-to technique that I use in the middle of the night. And then I'll transition to a cognitive technique. So we want to kind of occupy our mind a little bit. We don't want to perseverate on being awake and being angry. You know, why am I awake during the middle of the night? So have a little cognitive technique. So I like to do the cognitive shuffle I think of a word such as bedtime, and I imagine all the objects that I can, starting with that first letter. So B, ball, baby, bus, banana, move on to the next letter. Imagine things starting with E, 
eagle, egg, ear. I think last night I did the alphabet. So I just thought of like alligator, ball, cat, like ABC kind of went through. Um, I also use this with my kids as well, but they're not maybe the best to spellers. So I'll have them pick a color and then imagine all the objects they can with that color. So red, raspberry, strawberry, et cetera. You get the point. Um, and what this does is it simulates what our mind does when we fall asleep. And it also occupies our mind just a little bit so that we're not uh, as concerned about being awake during the middle of the night. Um, now, if you're still awake after you've tried these two techniques and we don't want to stare at the clock, you know, um, some scientists and I've actually said this before, like, let's follow the 20 minute rule where if you're in your bed, you're awake for 20 minutes, you want to get up out of bed. Well, you know, staring at the clock isn't a good idea. So what I do is I just say, okay, I'm going to do the breathing technique. I'm going to do the cognitive technique. If I'm still awake, I'm going to get up out of bed, only return back to bed when I'm sleepy, do an activity in low light, reading a paper book, for example. And then you only want to return back to bed when you're sleepy. And there'll be times when, you know, maybe it's you wake up at four in the morning and you can't go back to sleep. Well, could you potentially add in a 10 minute nap during your lunch the following day? You know, like, let's not be like, so concerned that this is a catastrophe. No, let's try and um, let's just add in a little nap and maybe that'll help us kind of get through the day a bit if this happens a lot. I love that approach to it too, because I do think a lot of times we'll have a night where we don't sleep well. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, I didn't sleep well. And now it's going to impact all these different things. And then of course the next night you're definitely not prepping yourself to sleep well. And it sort of snowballs versus just being like, Hey, it was a bad night of sleep. Maybe I can try these other things. Maybe you do look for other breathing techniques, but you don't stress over it. And you maybe even look for other ways you can change up your pre-bed routine or whatever else. I did like also seeing that you mentioned make your bedroom like a cave because I know I personally sleep better when it's dark. It also helps if it's not light because when it gets light, the dogs are all of a sudden up and they're like, you're up too because I see the light now. So making your room dark, but it's even little swaps like that. Are there any other suggestions? Like if you're really struggling to put in that pre-bed routine, create a space that does make you want to sleep, anything you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, the sleep environment is really important. And I love it because it pays dividends down the road. So if we can optimize our sleep environment, if we can add in blackout blinds, blackout curtains, if we can um, keep a lot of those electronics out of the bedroom, if we can have a good mattress, if we can have good earplugs, like these are, are things that will help us time and time and night and night. Again, you know, so it pays dividends down the road if we can optimize our sleep environment. So sleep environment is a good one. And yeah, I think it's keeping it like a cave, cool, dark and quiet is how I like to think about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can be difficult winding down. So potentially setting a bedtime alarm about an hour before you want to go to bed. Um, which is a cue to put those electronics devices away, stop working, do relaxing activities, take a warm bath or shower, which is so shown to make you fall asleep quicker. Even writing a to-do list, for example. So there was a study where they had a group write a to-do list right before bed. This was five minutes before bedtime. And the other group actually journaled about their day. And they found that the group who wrote the to-do list uh, fell asleep quicker, had better sleep quality. And they think it was related to kind of offloading those thoughts onto your mind um, and then putting it away. You know, we don't want to stress about everything I have to do. It's about offloading those thoughts, closing the book, putting it away. And that seemed to help uh, these people in that situation. Um, yeah, those are definitely some things that come to mind. And you can also utilize those breathing techniques before bedtime, utilize that cognitive technique as well. Um, given your audience too, um, being aware of how exercise too close to bedtime might impact your sleep or your ability to fall asleep quickly. Um, the results are a bit mixed when it comes to that. Typically, we see 
very high intense exercise about an hour before bedtime is not a good thing. Um, so, but there's a lot of individual variability, uh, maybe for someone, they may be a bit more sensitive. So even intense exercise, two and a half hours, may be a problem. So just really kind of keeping in mind some of those factors that could relate to your overall sleep, sleep and sleep quality, and then testing out what, what works best for you. I think that is truly like the key. If you're noticing that there's changes in your sleep and you started adding in workouts at night, even, even if it's multiple hours beforehand, using that data potentially from your wearable to say, Hey, my sleep pattern has changed. How can I then adjust my schedule a little bit more to make it worthwhile? And then also I love having the discussion with clients of like, yes, working out is very important. We don't want you to skip your workouts, but you also have to get your sleep. So designing workouts in a sustainable way that actually fits your schedule so that you're not cutting into your sleep. It's also ideal if possible. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. I mean, there's so, so many competing interests, you know, Uh, exercise is important. Nutrition is important. Stress reduction is important. Sleep is important. So it is challenging. It's very challenging to fit all that in. But um, I mean, even, even without exercise, like if we can get optimal sleep, we see those changes in those hormones, those appetite hormones, we're not going to crave sugar as much, we're not going to crave fats, we're going to see normal amounts of ghrelin, normal amounts of leptin. So um, I mean, I'm a sleep scientist, I have a bias towards preference for uh, sleep over exercise, but I'm also a part of the kinesiology department at University of Calgary. So exercise is important too. And I think it's it's interesting some of this work where um, even intense exercise during sleep deprivation may be a bit protective when it comes to um, reaction time and decision making. I mean, I think there was one study showing the benefits of intense exercise during sleep deprivation. Of course, it needs to be replicated, but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, with all these competing interests. There really are so many variables and it comes back to finding your balance with all the different stressors so that you can move, feel, look your best. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell everybody where they can find out more about your research, more information from you, especially if they are looking to improve the quality of their sleep? Absolutely. So I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at sleep for sport. I also have a website, sleepintowin.com, which I need to be a bit more active there. Um, And I'm at Cerebra.Health. That's kind of my full-time role as well. And we're really trying to change the way we diagnose and treat sleep disorders. So you can catch me out, catch me on any of those uh, areas there. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy Bender. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And I know everybody's going to be working on their sleep now. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me. So now to six metabolism boosting foods. And no, these aren't magic pills that are just gonna make your metabolism turn into a wildfire if it's a small little campfire, but they will really help you burn more calories and again, take advantage of that thermic effect of food. Not to mention all of these foods are really great for you and have other benefits as well. And I'm gonna share a great recipe using these six ingredients that makes for even a great snack and a very macro friendly one at that, very high protein. So let's talk about the six different foods. The first food is tuna. Uh, Salmon is also great. And I'm talking about even that canned tuna, that canned salmon. That is a great quick option when you want to boost your protein. Also, by having these fish, you can get in some great omega-3s, which have anti-inflammatory benefits. And that can be great for your metabolism as well. Protein is really the key here with that though. So you can even sub in other proteins if you want, but increasing your protein intake will help you build and retain lean muscle mass even while in a deficit, which will have great benefits for your metabolic health. And as we get older, since we're less able to utilize protein as efficiently, we wanna make sure that we actually are increasing our protein intake so that we're getting enough to build that lean muscle, especially timing it a little bit more consciously around our workouts. Uh, So I do love using tuna for this, recipe that I'm going to share shortly, uh, just because it's really easy and it's a great thing to have in your cabinet to grab even in a pinch, especially if you haven't been able to go to the store right away. Uh, Second thing I want to go over is chili peppers, cayenne, sriracha, using that capsaicin. Okay. So capsaicin is a chemical that has been shown to increase uh, the rate at which our body burns calories, which is awesome, right? Increasing that calorie burn, thermic effect of food, 
benefits right there for our metabolism. Plus, the great thing about spices like this is they add seasoning, they add flavor to our diet meals. I 100% do not believe that eating well, eating according to your goals has to not be tasty. It can be delicious. It can be flavorful. So think about adding things like those peppers to your meals, especially if you like spicy food, which probably use way too much of those things in mind. The third ingredient I'm going to go over is cucumbers, okay? So you might be thinking, well, cucumbers? Why not like another vegetable? Cucumbers are actually great because of their water content. So whether you're a person who is not as great at drinking water as you should be, or you just even want to increase and improve your hydration because hydration has great benefits for our metabolic health, uh, cucumbers or different foods that actually have a higher water content are great to include. We also have to remember that getting more water burns more calories as well through water-induced thermogenesis, so that thermic effect of food again to boost our metabolic rate. Uh, and the great part about cucumbers especially is they also have electrolytes, natural ones. The fourth food I wanted to go over is ginger. Uh, ginger is another great way to add flavor to your meals, and actually it really packs a punch in this recipe, which I was really pleasantly surprised by. Uh, but it's also been shown to enhance the thermic effect of food and promote feelings of fullness, which is good if you're in a calorie deficit and you want to make sure that you feel content and fueled. It may affect how your body burns fat, digests carbs, and even uses insulin to help regulate blood sugar. It also has anti-inflammatory benefits, which can be helpful in keeping your me metabolism healthy. The fifth ingredient is avocado. Yum! So healthy monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats help boost your metabolism, and they also help keep you feeling fuller for longer. There's also great antioxidants in avocados as well, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And the fat, when you're using it in a dish, can add creaminess without using other things, which is really good. Uh, they can help reduce inflammation as well, which keeps your metabolism functioning very well. And just be conscious if you are including avocado or any of these foods that, while very nutrient dense, can be a little bit more calorically dense that you're not blowing your macros or your calorie intake for the day if you are trying to create that deficit for fat loss. The sixth ingredient I want to go over is actually the one that most people are going to be like, what? Because it's kind of a little bit hated. Iodized salt. Okay, so iodine is really, really key. And actually, salt is very often demonized, but it plays an important role in maintaining our health and our hydration. Okay. The iodine part of this is an essential mineral and it's an antioxidant. Uh, it plays an important role in maintaining our metabolic health. So it is really key that we are not deficient in iodine. It's needed to make thyroid hormones, which assists with the creation of proteins and enzyme activity, as well as regulating normal metabolism. Uh, without enough iodine, you actually can see that your thyroid hormones will not work properly and it can lead to underactive or even overactive thyroid issues, which can, especially underactive, can lead to weight gain. That's why I wanted to include iodized salt in this recipe, um, but I also will show you another fix if you're not so much a fan or you have to limit salt for any health concerns of getting in iodine as well. So let's jump into the delicious recipe. It is spicy tuna and avocado cucumber bites. So the ingredients, one cucumber sliced into rounds, one can of tuna drained, 30 grams of avocado mashed, one quarter teaspoon cayenne pepper, one quarter teaspoon iodized salt, one teaspoon of grated ginger or one half teaspoon of ground ginger, and then one to two teaspoons of sriracha or to your taste. And if you're like me, probably way too much. So slice the cucumbers into circles, then mash the avocado and tuna together and add in the pepper, salt, ginger, and sriracha. Although you can also drizzle the sriracha on if you prefer after. Then top the cucumber with the tuna and avocado mixture. If you want a little crunch, you can add roasted seaweed snacks into quarters on top of the mixture. By adding the seaweed to the recipe, you're adding a source of iodine, iron, and other minerals that are really great. The seaweed also adds a slight salty flavor and a nice crunch. The macros for this, not including the seaweed, are 296 calories, 42 grams of protein, 14 grams of carbs, and 8 grams of fat. So let's talk about designing those workouts to help boost your metabolic rate. Muscle is the focus. Muscle is metabolically costly. It helps us burn more calories even at rest. The more muscle we have, the more we'll keep our metabolism humming. So I wanted to talk about how to design your workouts to really promote this. 
And I know, especially when we do want to lose fat, we think about burning more calories from recession. But we've got to stop that focus if we actually want to not only see the best fat loss results, but sustain those results long term. So I know it's really tempting to cut out rest, to make yourself feel more slaughtered from your workouts, to turn to cardio because it does have a higher calorie burn, especially on those different tracking devices. But don't do this if you want to boost your metabolism, especially as you get older. Because it gets harder to build and retain lean muscle as we get older, we're less able to utilize protein as efficiently. We need to do everything we can from our training standpoint to help promote those adaptations to help muscle grow. So what this means is actually embracing sometimes slowing down in our sessions. While I love metabolic strength workouts, things like the sevens, things like uh, that get our blood pumping and do eliminate some rest, I think it can be key, especially if you're creating that calorie deficit for fat loss and you know we're having hormonal changes or getting a little bit older, that we embrace those rest periods. And one of my favorite designs to actually do this is the one, two, three. So what this is, is you do that single heavy compound lift. You get out those barbells, you get out those heavy weights, and you think about a compound movement like the sumo deadlift. And if you are listening, you can see sort of demos of some of the movements that I'm going to go through for this workout design by watching the YouTube video. But you know, maybe a, a kettlebell is a heavy weight for you. Maybe it's using that barbell for that sumo deadlift, but you think, okay, I'm going to do a weight that challenges me for three to five reps with this compound movement. And then you know what? I'm going to embrace resting for three to five minutes. I know that can feel like a long time. I know you can even feel recovered before then because your heart rate has come down, whatever else. Your muscles aren't necessarily feeling pumped. But you want that full rest to actually be able to lift your heaviest. I would rather you came back so rested, you're like, wow, I can go up the next round instead. Okay. But you want to think about how can I max out in that like three to five rep range, maybe even one to five if you really want to work towards that max rep, max weight. Okay. You do this first in your workout, you embrace those longer rest periods. Then after that, you go into the set of two. This can be a superset or a compound set. And superset would mean alternating areas worked. So that could mean something like maybe you do a goblet squat, okay? And then you actually do a floor press. And so you could have dumbbells, you could do a bench press, you can use barbells, but you can do that floor press and you can even press that weight, okay? So it's complementary areas or two different areas. So upper, lower, chest and back, that type of thing for the superset. If you were doing the compound set, you might do that squat, and then you could either do another compound movement, like a front lunge, or you could even do a lean back if you want to do more of a compound burner. The more you focus on those compound movements, especially if you're shorter on time, the more you're going to increase that calorie burn, the more you're really going to work more global muscles and make sure you're building that lean muscle. Especially if you do have stubborn areas, that's where you can start to implement isolation moves, but they don't want to be your focus, okay? So you're going to do those two movements back to back for two bigger areas, working with more compound exercises, but still while honing in a little bit more in that 6 to 12 or even 8 to 12 rep range. You're going to think more like 90 seconds of rest between those rounds, so you won't fully recover but the reps are a little higher. That being said, no weight should ever feel easy. If it's eight to 12 reps that you're shooting for, especially the more advanced you are with those exercises, the more you wanna shoot for those eight reps, even erring on that last round of only being able to hit six, putting the weight down to finish the last two. Okay, then after that, you're gonna to wanna to go into a tri-set. In this tri-set, rest is gonna be more in that 45 to 60 or 60 to 90 rep, uh, rest range, and you're gonna think three moves back to back. This is where, depending on your focus, depending on how many times you're training in the week, you can start to get into more of the isolation moves. But if you did, say, a uh, squat and then a floor press in your superset, maybe in this circuit you do include that front lunge. Maybe you even front load it, right? You hold the kettlebell up and you front load it and you do the front lunge in the triset. And you're thinking potentially in that 8 to 12 even going up towards 10 to 15 rep range, especially the more isolated, the more you're gonna to wanna to think 10 to 20 reps even, because again, no weight is ever light, no move is ever easy, but sometimes with those isolation moves, we can't do our max weight, right? So we have to use reps to fully fatigue the area. But you wanna think three moves back to back and then, and then that rest. The fewer times you have to train, the more you want that tricep to be focused on those compound exercises, those multi-joint movements. If you are training more frequently, then you can think, okay, that would be a time to use the lean back, maybe some calf raises, maybe an ab exercise. If you did the floor press and you wanted to target something with your chest, shoulders, and triceps, maybe do lateral raise or a bench dip or something to target those triceps versus the shoulders. Sorry, lateral raise shoulders. Um, 
But then you want to think, okay, how you use those moves will also be based on your weekly progression. Don't be doing body part splits with this. You want to think again, using as many compound moves as possible. So anterior posterior split can be good. Full body split if you only have three days a week, or even that hemisphere upper lower alternating if you're going to do more like four to six days a week, okay? But embrace those rest periods so that every single round through, you can either be going heavier, you can still be intentional with moves, you can really be focused on what you feel working while challenging those muscles. But the rest is key so that you can actually push your muscles to have to repair and rebuild. I know it feels sometimes more challenging, you get more out of breath when you cut out that rest, but a lot of times then we're just you know, burning calories, but we're not actually creating the, the, the challenge that we really need to get our muscles to grow. So make sure that you're using that rest. Try that one, two, three workout design. I'd love to hear how you're implementing it into your routine, but remember that muscle is metabolically costly. If we want to get that metabolism humming, if we want to look leaner, if we want to gain muscle as we get older, we need to focus on those heavy lifts and using that rest to our advantage. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Fitness Hacks podcast. I'd love to hear your biggest takeaway from this episode and things you'd like to see in future episodes.